Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys? Can you hear me? Hello. Let's see, who do we have in here? Hi, Rachel. Thank you guys for the compliments on the thumbnail. Daisy, Max and Shaw, Blockavelli, Eliza. Um, I It's so funny that people are complimenting us on this thumbnail because what happened was today and Dosi was like, you know, we never put up a thumbnail about the live tonight. <laughs> it was like, what, two hours ago? So in between sessions today, because I was working, we got a little something by my window and it on an iPhone and everything, and it ended up looking so cute. So thank you for everybody commenting on the thumbnail. Okay, so can you guys hear me? Can you hear? Okay, great. Hello, hello. All righty. Okay, good. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. There's so many different covers of this book. Hi, Janoli. Good to see you again. Um, there are so many different covers of this book. I love this one because she's actually on there. And for those of you who don't know, The Bell Jar is a fictionalized um, story that is really based on her actual experiences, but she changed some of the details, changed the names, and what it describes is her experience falling into madness. Um, she ends up in an asylum, and this is um, going to have spoilers and also trigger warning. Um, let me go ahead and put that in the chat, actually. Trigger warning for, um, we're going to be talking about suicide, predominantly depression. Okay, and I will be using the word suicide. I know that um, I've seen some people refer to it as like unaliving and things like that, but I will be using the word suicide or the phrase kill yourself um, as I describe it. So if those words are triggering to you, please take care of yourself. You do not have to be here, but for those of you who are here, really happy to have you here. So um, we figure out how to do polls in the chat when I say we, I mean in Dosi, my husband. So, <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, okay. There's only four options. Oh, really? Okay, so um, we're doing a poll right now on what you rate the book. So I'm curious for those of you, a lot of people responded when I announced that this was the book of the month, that this is a book they actually either had to read in school um, some people said they had to read it in high school. Some people had to read it in college. So I'm curious, do you have a book list that you will be talking about and when? A book list, Adrian? What do you mean? I mean, this today we're talking about this book, The Bell Jar. Um, I don't have a list of the schedule. If you're asking what books are coming up in the schedule, I should do that. I do actually know what book we're reading next, though. Um, so the next book we'll be reading will be Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson. Um, she is a therapist and considered one of the like founders um, or one of the pioneers in couples therapy. She does a lot of work around attachment and relationships. And um, this book is about how to provide security within your relationship. So Hold Me Tight is the next book we'll be reading. And we'll be doing that book club on... I've been trying to do them like the last Tuesday of every month. Hmm? Lost connection? I did? Well, I just did. Yeah. Oh, okay. You guys can hear me. Okay. So the next book club will be on August 29th, and we'll be reading Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson. Um, perfect, Adrian. Yeah, so that'll be our next book. But today we're going to be talking about um, the bell jar. So let's go ahead and get started with talking about the bell jar. First, I want to know, um, we did put in there to see what your ratings are for the book. It looks like so far 100% of you um, think that this book is a five star. Okay, so we got one vote in there. So one person here thought it was five stars. For me, I rate this book really three stars, maybe 3.5 stars. And the reason I rate it there is because I think that Sylvia Plath did a wonderful job with 
um, her imagery. So the way she described things, I remember she was talking about the fold of a napkin as being a crisp white isosceles napkin. And I thought she did an excellent job painting a picture of her surroundings and the people around her. Um, however, I felt that the story lacked a, a plot or a narrative, and I know that it was kind of autobiographical, so that can be difficult to manage. Um, but because of that, I didn't find the book to be super enjoyable to read. It was a book that I didn't mind reading, but it was not like a, one of my favorite books to read. Now, I personally enjoy reading about um, disorders, mental illness, because as a therapist, I think it gives me an inside view into what that um, pro the progression may look like uh, from functioning normally to feeling emotionally dysregulated to psychosis. So I do enjoy reading about that. But I felt that even though this book did demonstrate that, it was not, um, to me, very clearly illustrated where I could say, hey, based on this book, I could see the signs if that was what I was looking for. Um, so I books I would prefer in terms of like uh, kind of depicting madness, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, I think um, that book beautifully illustrates what it looks like to, you know, just be functioning in the world, to make connection and have relationships, but still have trauma be significantly impacting you. If you're looking for um, a memoir, um, I'm glad my mom died. That talks about eating disorders. And um, I love how that explores her relationship with her mother. You know, Sylvia Plath's book is supposed to explore the relationship with her mother, so much so that her mother actually did not want the book to be published in the U.S. after it was published in the U.K. because she was so embarrassed um, or so ashamed of the way that Sylvia portrayed her in the book. And even though, again, she changed names and changed details, it was still very closely aligned with her own life. And her mother actually came out later and wrote her own um story kind of telling her side of the story. And so that I think is, you know, not really that explored in this book. I was expecting to see a lot more of the relationship between Sylvia and her mother since that was her mother's reaction to it. Um, but, you know, it, that really wasn't explored that well either. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, what things in this book resonated with me. And so one of the things that I think was really interesting is that as you see Esther, which is the, our protagonist, protagonist's name, as you see Esther go from being on probably, let's say, like this pedestal of her life, we come into her life at a time where she is really objectively excelling. She is part of this scholarship program. She is spending a lot of time with wealthy girls. She uses her mind to be able to get there. So, But she has the pressure of keeping this grant as scholarship to be able to do that. So she talks a lot about always making straight A's no matter what class she's in. She even comes up with these ploys to um, not have to do subjects that really overwhelm her, even though she knows she can get a straight A in it. So um, looking at how uh, Sylvia depicted Esther as this super high achiever, and for us to just see over time how she ends up, you know, in an asylum, and, you know, she goes from being very respected to almost being completely discredited. And that's what we see when people um, end up having mental health issues is that they start losing credibility in our society, which is a major problem. Um, one of the main things that I deal with when I'm working with my clients is, you know, as let's say if they have a history, like I have a client who um, has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, bipolar one. And so they had a manic episode years ago, have not had one since, but ever since then, people treat them in such a different way because they're always like, oh, if I say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, when re in reality, this client is managing their symptoms really well. They know the signs, they're taking their medication. They make sure that they get enough sleep. They're very, very careful and have not had any other um, manic episodes. Not to say that you can control manic episodes all the time, but th in this case, this client has been able to successfully manage their symptoms. And so I hate to see that transition in our society where because a person has had a history of even something as common as depression or anxiety, a lot of times they are 
not given as much credibility or respect because they have mental health issues. And I've seen it so much even with my clients where they might have parents that say things to them like, um, you know, you're being melodramatic or you need to call your therapist. You need to go to psychiatrist. Did you take your pills today? Really weaponizing them trying to manage symptoms by throwing it in their face whenever they become upset with them. So that is one of the primary things that I think stood out to me is that you see Esther's credibility kind of fall as her position in society falls and declines with her mental health. She's not taken seriously from the beginning when she starts saying, hey, I haven't been eating. I haven't been sleeping. Um, I can't read. She talks about how she couldn't even write anymore. You know, she tried to write and it was completely illegible or it looked like child's handwriting. And she's trying to tell people, like, I'm not doing well. And it took so much advocating for herself for her to even get taken seriously. But then she starts losing the autonomy over her life by having to go to asylum after asylum. The book actually ends in a very uncomfortable place. It ends with her basically stepping into a psychiatrist's office to be evaluated to see if she can leave this last asylum. Now, for those of you who don't know, Sylvia Plath actually ended up killing herself not long after this book um, was written. So I don't think she ever even saw it be published. And a lot of critics um, have argued that the reason the book is considered to be a classic, the reason why it was published and the reason why it was so successful is because it was posthumous, saying that basically her suicide almost publicized the book um, because she's talking about the decline in her mental health throughout the course of the book. Um, and so... And then something else I found out today is that, um, and uh, if you don't know, I won't give too much details about how she killed herself. I think that will be a little bit too far, but I will say that both of her children were present. They didn't see it. They were in a different room, but they were there. They were ages one and two. And I actually, um, yes, yes, I was just about to say that. And I actually found out that her son ended up committing suicide as well when he was 47. So we do see um, a lot of times one of the first things that we will assess when we're meeting a new client, we'll look for family history. That's not to say that if you have a family history, this is just bound to happen to you. You are absolutely at risk, but it is helpful for us to know if there's a family history because it gives us a starting point in terms of looking for diagnoses. So I also wanted to ask you all if you could put a question um, in the poll. How many of you had to read this in school? Yes or no? Now, I think that, um, okay, so yeah, let's look at this poll. So for what we rate the book. So most people rated this book five stars. 20% of our voters uh uh, four stars. Okay. So basically it's like we had about two people voting for five stars and then everybody else went down to two. Um, now we couldn't put one star on there because we found out we can only have four options in the poll. We're trying to move to a different platform for um, our lives. They will still be on YouTube, but we'll be using something else to kind of help us with polls and pulling your questions up on screen and things like that. Okay, so people did not have to, some people are saying they did not have to read this in school. I cannot remember if I had to read this in school or not. Let me tell you, when I was in um, high school, middle school, uh, even undergrad, and I got a book assignment. Now, I don't know about y'all, but for me back then, it was always spark notes. Like I did not read the actual book. I was never a fast reader. These teachers had the expectations that you would get through like a 300 page book in a week on top of all of your other assignments. For those of you who were able to do it, my hats are off, my hat is off to you. However, I was not one of those people. I was a Spark Notes girl. So um, if I had to read this, it doesn't, I'm not, I don't remember it. I mean, I feel like there's no way I didn't have to read this because I did take psychology classes in high school, obviously took literature classes. Then when I went to college, I took, of course, psychology classes, a lot of women's studies classes, which a lot of people consider this to be um, a feminist book. Uh, which you can kind of understand them because she talks a lot about not wanting to get married, not wanting to have children, um, basically trying to understand, like, how do you manage all that household stuff and still have a career? And so I just can't see why I wouldn't be assigned this book. I mean, I did sociology courses. I feel like all of these things would fall under here. 
but I don't remember reading it in school. So whenever I would look up novels about mental illness and mental health, this was one of the main books that was recommended. So I just felt like we couldn't introduce novels into the book club without starting with this one, but I did not love the book. Okay, I was never assigned this, but I went to Spark Notes this one for sure. Absolutely. Oh, Ray be reading. Hey, that's Ray Shonda, my friend. Hi, Ray. Yeah, so um, I'm really curious. So it looks like most people did not have to read this in school, but I don't know if you guys saw the comments when I originally announced that this was the book of the month. It was very interesting because so many people were like, oh my gosh, I had to read this in high school. It was really hard for me to read. Um, you know, people were encouraging me to put a trigger warning on there because they found it very disturbing. So that's my next question for you. For those of you who read the book or who have read it in the past, did you find this book to be a disturbing read for you? Um, I'm very, very curious about that because for me, I personally did not find the book disturbing to read, but I also think that I'm somewhat desensitized to um, talking about things like suicide, depression, um, psychosis. I personally am not as affected by that because it's a part of my daily work. It's something that I'm talking about every single day with clients in various stages of life. And so um, I didn't find it disturbing, but it might personally just be because I am very accustomed to um, having these conversations. Okay, so Paint It Black says, yes, a disturbing read, but I appreciated it for what it was, raw and authentic. Um, yeah, so I definitely agree with you. I think that it was very raw and it definitely was authentic. I think that um, there might be, I think because she's so raw in this book that um, I think nowadays she probably would probably be canceled. Like if this book came out today, she'd probably be canceled. And I'm wondering if that's why a lot of people aren't reading it in school within the last 20 years. Because it seems like Prior to that, it was a very common thing to have assigned in a syllabus. Um, okay, so let me read this, paint it black. You said, Sylvia committed suicide. Ted's mistress, Asia, committed murder-suicide with their daughter. Oh, my goodness. And Sylvia, Ted's son, also committed suicide in the early 2000s. Yeah, I saw about the son, but I didn't know about his mistress. That is really, really interesting. So, um, you know, I won't go into too much detail about that, but that is, you know, you can see that it can be hereditary, but you also see there's a common thread there with Ted, who Ted was um, Sylvia Plath's husband. So I'm very curious about, um, I, heard, I heard that he was a very kind of controlling man. The reason that I say that, because they even said that they were separated maybe, something like that. But after she died, he had the rights to all of her work, including her unpublished works as well. Um, so that to me really just showed that he had his hand in a lot of what she had going on. Um, did you have to read this book in school? Okay. So did you find this to be a disturbing read? Um, how disturbing did you find this read? Oh, I can't open the poll. Okay. But yeah, so personally, I didn't find it uh, too disturbing. Mistress did it with stove too and laid with daughter in bed. Oh my goodness. Oh, now that is disturbing um, to read about that. So the actual mental inner workings that lead to that decision don't disturb me as much as, you know, kind of the action itself and especially the murder element. I think that is just, that right there is very, very hard to read and see. I did not know that paint it black. Um, so let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, I wanted to ask you all, what did you think was the main meaning of the term the bell jar? So Sylvia mentions it in the book quite a few times, um, especially towards the end where she keeps talking about the bell jar. And I was starting to kind of lose my grasp on what I thought that meant. Um, and so for those of you who have read it, what did the term the bell jar mean to you? To me, I thought that she was talking about being stuck in a certain way of feeling and being and um, not being able to escape. Because I remember toward the end, she was saying for... Let's 
spend it. I'm trying to find it. Here we go. So someone says to her um, that after she when she was trying to get out of the asylum, they said, we'll take up where we left off, Esther. She had said with her sweet martyr smile, we'll act as if this were all a bad dream. And then to the person in the bell jar, this is what Esther says, blank and stopped as a dead baby. The world itself is the bad dream. So I think the bell jar just represents a certain place of, what's the word? Not distress. What is the word I'm looking for? It's being in this place of, I guess we could just use the word depression. Like nothing brings you joy. Everything is a sad story. She even talks about it in the beginning, how when she was at the height of her success, you know, being in school and being at the scholarship, how that didn't bring her joy. She was like, I, I could get a full expense paid cruise around the world and I would still feel depressed. I would feel the same way. So being stuck in the bell jar, being um, not being able to like see the world for what it is, it's like this cloud, this layer around you of just um, sadness and despondence. That's the word I was looking for. Suppression, defeat, repression. I thought it referenced the jars the babies were stored in from the beginning where she was with Buddy in med school. Hmm. So the part that Ray's talking about is there's this guy that keeps coming up in the story named Buddy. And he basically wants to be with Esther and his family wants him to be with Esther. But Esther is very much, I just, I found she generally just didn't care about people in general. That for me is how I read it. I felt like she really didn't like anybody, didn't really want to be around anybody. And she is not excluded from that list of people she really didn't want to be around, of course. Um, and so Buddy is this person who is like, you know, constantly pursuing her. He's writing her letters and, you know, they just have this long history together, even with his family and his parents. Um, and he's a doctor. So she goes to medical school with him one day and she describes seeing um, babies that were born, you know, before they were supposed to preterm. And, you know, they I guess they kept them all in these jars. And so to you, Ray, you thought that she was um, you thought that she was describing herself as one of those babies in the jar, like being stuck in a place that you didn't choose and not being able to experience or have a full life with no other options. Ooh, I love that. I think that is a really good interpretation of what the bell jar represents. I think too, like the thing about her, she did have options, you know, it seemed like she had so many options and the future was like, you know, the world was her oyster. People want to use that phrase, but she was so unhappy no matter where she was. Um, and I think ultimately when she what couldn't stay busy, that's the thing that really expedited her path to madness. Because when she was able to focus on making straight A's or focus on her internship or even hyper-focus on people like her friend at the beginning, I can't remember her friend's name. Was it Dina? Maybe it was Dina. Um, that, you know, when she can hyper-focus on these situations, it gives her something to do. But when she wasn't able to get a job, um, with that she thought she was going to get that internship and she didn't get it. I think that is where her thoughts were able to take a hold. And I see that with my clients as well. Clients who have um, a depressive tendency, however, they are able to stay busy or very active in their social life. That's why when we had the pandemic and people were forced to quarantine, we saw heightened um mental health issues because people were having such a hard time with not being as busy and engaged in social as they typically were before. Ways of kind of distracting ourselves or in some cases giving ourselves purpose. Um, but I think in Esther's case, she was kind of distracting herself from all of those thoughts that she was having about not wanting to live. I, Let's see. Esther, Esther wasn't a very likable character. I agree with that. And I think I'm the kind of person that really enjoys a book where you can, maybe the protagonist is not perfect. I'm okay with like a protagonist who's like very hard to like, but you can understand why they are the way that they are. 
I think the problem with this book is that Esther doesn't really talk enough about her own background. I think in her childhood, where I can really sympathize with the character. Now, you you know, it's not our job to sympathize with the person's mental illness. We don't, they don't, we don't, they don't, they don't have to have our sympathy. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect victim. But I just think for narrative purposes, for the purposes of a book, maybe starting the book a little further back in her story, we would have been able to understand her journey a little bit more. And so I, I did find it a little bit difficult to like the character as well. And since the character was based on Sylvia herself, I, I personally felt um, bad about that because I'm like, I don't, I know that this is based off of her real life, but I think that the way the story was told, it, it just wasn't told in a way where it's easy to empathize with your main character. Okay, so I think that we're going to, um, Oh, 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 I'm going to be doing a giveaway for our next book. Our next book is called Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson. And I'll read you the um, synopsis of that book if you wanted to kind of know a little bit about it before um, entering for the giveaway. Okay. So um, Sue Johnson is one of the pioneers, if not the pioneer of emotionally focused therapy. Like I said, it's very much based in attachment. So we'll be getting back to our um, more nonfiction self-help books. Um, I know that's what a lot of you prefer in this book club, but I'll read you what this book is about. Um, do, do, do. Emotionally focused therapy works because it's viewed because it, it views the love relationship as an attachment bond. This idea, which was once controversial, is now supported by science and has become widely popular among therapists around the world. In Hold Me Tight, Dr. Sue Johnson presents emotionally focused therapy to the general public for the first time. Johnson teaches that the way to save and enrich a relationship is to reestablish safe emotional connection and preserve the attachment bond. With this in mind, she focuses on key moments in a relationship from recognizing the demon dialogue to revisiting a rocky moment and uses them as touch points for seven healing conversations. So this book is um, called Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. If that title sounds familiar, it's because our very first book that we ever read was by John Gottman. And that one is called, is it, it's Eight Dates. Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. So something about Sue Johnson and John Gottman, I personally view them as like um, kind of nemeses a little bit. Um, and if you do want to, uh, how does the book club work? Would like to join? All you have to do is read the book and join the YouTube. And we also have many discussions going on on Goodreads. Um, I think that is in the description box of all of my uh, books. But yeah, Hold Me Tight is the book club book. So if you are wanting to get that book in the giveaway that I'll be doing, go ahead and put your Instagram handle in the chat box and put Hold Me Tight. Um, the reason why I have to do Instagram handles is because we cannot do DMs on YouTube. Um, so please just put those in the chat and we will... Um, pick a winner based on that. Um, hold me tight. So I was saying, I think Sue Johnson and John Gottman, I think of them like sometimes like nemeses a little bit because Sue Johnson has even directly critiqued John Gottman's work by saying that he doesn't talk about the root cause of the issues that are being presented in relationships. And she is offering she believes that she is offering the root cause issues that a lot of times you have the attachment mismatches um, that are happening with rela within relationships and causing problems. So if you are interested in getting that book, Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson, just put your Instagram handle in the chat and I will be giving that away. I can give it to you however you want. If you want an audio book, if you want the physical book, or if you want an ebook, I can do that as well. Now, let me go to my last few notes on this book. I knew this was going to be a bit of a shorter um, book club because, you know, with the novel, there's not as much to unpack, um, at least with this novel, I would say, because a lot of the story is the same. Let's see. 
Did you have to read this book? Finish. Oh, one other question that a lot of people have is what would Esther's diagnosis be? And I actually meant to grab my um, DSM little cheat sheet kind of thingy. But um, I think that um, Esther obviously had depression, but I also think that she likely had bipolar disorder only because when you talk about not being able to sleep, at one point she talks about not being able to sleep for like 30 days. That is one of the primary indicators of a manic episode. Um, and so when we see mania and depression, that is usually an indication of bipolar one. Um, but the thing about her uh, manic episodes is we don't necessarily see hyper productivity. However, when I think about her getting straight A's and being so, so high functioning earlier on in her life, I think that might be, have been some of that hyper productivity that we can see with the manic stage. So I think bipolar one, if we were to go based on today's DSM would probably be definitely at least one of her diagnoses. Um, but a lot of people also think that there could be some schizophrenic components uh, to her uh, diagnosis as well. I think because the story is told from her perspective, I can't confidently say what would be a delusion or hallucination. She does show a lot of signs of paranoia in the book. When people are talking to her and she's questioning in the back of her mind, if they're testing her to see if she'll be able to recognize whether or not they're lying or see if she would act, actually expect them to believe what they're saying, those are major signs of paranoia. So whenever I have clients that are often talking to me about, you know, people you know, like everybody in their life is against them or, you know, every person is like whispering behind their back. And, you know, sometimes that could just be true, but sometimes it could be signs of cognitive distortions and misinterpretations of social interactions. Um, and if you are constantly in a place where you feel paranoid about interactions with people, what they're thinking about you, assuming that almost like your engagements with people is like a right or wrong exam. Like you can say the right thing, the wrong thing, and they're testing you to see what you can or can't say most people. Like most people just really don't. They, they don't even have like the forethought to be thinking in their mind that you're supposed to be answering this way or that or that way. So those signs of paranoia could lead to a little bit more of a schizophrenic diagno diagnosis, but there are a lot of different diagnoses that include psychosis and even bipolar one can include psychosis as well. So I think for me, if I was to be diagnosing her based off what we read in this book, I would probably diagnose her with the bipolar one, which back then was most often referred to as manic depression. Okay, so let's see. This is one of the few books I've read more than once. Okay, so Allegra, I'm curious for you, what is your rating for the book? Would you say it's a five star for you, the fact that you have read it more than once? Thank you, Eliza, Aisha, and Amber for putting in your Instagram handles. Um, and if you win, you can. I will reach out to you on Instagram and you just let me know your preference for how to receive our next book. Um, our next book club meeting, again, is going to be on... August 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Okay, are you still in her Allegra? Because I was curious, like, if you've read this book multiple, because I don't find my, I don't see myself ever reading this book again. Um, but again, for me, it was a three star. But I do know that if I did read through it again, I probably would find more in there that I like. Um, but it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, oh, oh. I also have to say, one of my favorite things about this book, I did hybrid reading. So I did the physical book, I did an ebook because the ebook is how I keep my notes for these lives, as well as the audio book. But my favorite of those three was the audio book. For those of you who don't, don't know, Maggie Gyllenhaal, who if you don't know her, I mean, she's one of my favorite um, actresses. She does the uh, audio book reading and she is fantastic. I think she brings each character to life. And I could totally see her playing this character in a movie. Let's see, I read it in college, 2012. And then again, last year, 10 year difference. Um, a lot has happened in my life and I rated a four. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and I, I could agree with the four star rating on this book as well. I was actually thinking I might do like 3.5, but then when I was comparing it to books like The Perks of Being a Wallflower, um, and then I was talking with Ray earlier, she was saying she thinks that um, she thought the book was going to be more like uh, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. 
um, which is another book that kind of talks a little bit about mental illness um, and disordered thinking. And, I, you know, that is another book, five stars. So in comparison to those books, I just couldn't really give it um, four or five stars. Let's see, Homey Tight, Design for Couples or for Couples or Wood, uh, reading it be good for singles as well. So my thought in general, now keep in mind, I'll be reading it with you guys. So I haven't read it myself. But I think in general, especially when you're talking about um, reading a book that is talking about attachment, I think sometimes it's good to get a head start on those kind of readings even before you're in a relationship, because a lot of times it helps you pick partners who are a little bit more compatible with your attachment style. So if you are looking for something that you'd be able to use right away with a partner, it might not be the best fit. But if you're looking for something where you can kind of get a little bit of information from professionals and the best way to conduct conversations and get your next relationship started off on the right foot. Um, I know that it's something that, you know, no matter where I am, I like to just make sure, like I read a lot of books, for example, about parenting, even though I'm not a parent, I like to just make sure that I'm understanding the typical issues that people are talking about when it comes to parenthood so that by the time I am a parent, I can kind of avoid some of those pitfalls. Nobody's going to be perfect, but I think the more research, the more information, the better. So I would say it's kind of up to you. Well, yeah, there, and Dosi was asking me, did I mention that how the audiobook was different than the regular book? You know, the audiobook, I'm assuming, came out, well, definitely came out later than the version of the book I was reading, because I think this book is from like 97. And the audiobook, I'm pretty sure, came out at the very earliest, could be like 2006, but I think it was an even, um, even later. And I noticed that there were some parts they took out or changed between the book and the audiobook. And I'm not sure if that was for narrative purposes, or I know that the, um, her mom really had an issue with the publishing of the book. So like, for example, there was one part where she talked about, you know, I'm going to start over in a new place and just pretend that I'm an orphan. And they took that part out of the book. And I just could not understand why, because a few pages later, there she's talking about being an orphan again. So I thought that was a really weird thing. So I don't know if it was like just to make it more concise. Okay, A.V. Lopez says, I first read this book as a teenager and have read it multiple times since. It was the first book that made me fall in love with reading. I love that. Um, so for you, A.V., what would you say is your rating of, of one to five stars? Like, does that mean that it's a five star read for you just because you read it multiple times? Or is it a different rating for you each time you read? I'd love to know that. Um, Allegra said the same thing. And she said that for uh, that Allegra said that it was a four star for them. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and close the giveaway um, for anyone who wants that next book, Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. Very, I just can't believe how similar the titles are between that because John Gottman has um, eight dates, eight conversations for a lifetime of love. Um, and so I just feel like those two always a little bit, I would say, competing, but that could just be me projecting. But I have directly heard Sue Johnson on the podcast kind of critiquing Gottman's method for working with couples. Um, so I will just say that I personally think that, um, oh, congratulations, Painted Black. Yay. And thank you so much for um, being participating so much in the um, book club tonight. Okay. You rated it four stars, Gerby Girl. Am I saying that right? Gerby girl is a gerb girl. Let's just go with gerb girl. Um, and for some of you who are just coming in, I know I've been getting a ton of questions about my next sit down video or if I'm going to be reviewing any more shows or movies. I definitely will. You guys, it's been a really rough few weeks. It's been a really rough few weeks. So we have been so behind on the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is like, you know, my little baby side project, but I do still work full time as a therapist. So that work does come first. Um, but if you guys have things that you want me to review, I'm wanting to get back into doing some more topics, just general topics outside of reviews. Like um, I did film a video kind of about like online dating and ways to kind of uh, put yourself forward in a way that could be more effective, how to kind of um, be able to assess potential partners in a more effective way so you don't waste as much time, the best places to, to go, things like that, just based on 
the clients I'm working with and who's been successful with the online dating thing, you know. Um, and I know a lot of people are like so jaded at this point when it comes to online dating and I completely understand. So I was getting that request a lot. So I did film that. Um, yes, congratulations again, Painted Black. Um, so I did film that and there are other shows that I could do. I'm really thinking about doing a Twilight breakdown. I know that there are already quite a few, but I am a true Twilight fan. Like I, when you talk about rewatching, rereading, like I've done it so many times I've completely lost count. Um, and so I was thinking about kind of breaking down Twilight. So y'all let me know what you're thinking in terms of if you want me to do anything, you know, old school, anything new that's out. I know you guys really love the reality TV space, like Love is Blind. People have been mentioning 90 Day Fiance. I've actually never watched 90 Day Fiance. So um, I should check that out for you guys. Okay, yes, The Twilight. Okay, I was not expecting that. Um, thanks for holding this book club. Thank you for coming. Entertainment Direct, like, honestly, these are very fun for me to do because... A, they don't require any editing, and B, they keep me on my toes in terms of, um, I already read a lot, but I don't always read books that will help me in terms of the work that I do. Um, so this book club really holds me accountable to making sure I'm reading books about trauma, reading books about um, relationships, reading books about family dynamics, um, reading books that I think will help my subscribers, you know, if I can make some content around it and also uh, reading books that I can help my clients, which is my, obviously my number one priority is to be able to support my clients. So if you guys ever want me to make any breakdowns based on certain books, let me know that too. I'd be happy to do that because I know a lot of people are like, I'm not into reading, but I do want to know, like, <laughs> I do want to know about the books that you're reading and I could possibly just do some um, videos that would break down some of the books that we're reading in the club. Okay, let's see, Twilight movie. Okay, you guys, I missed, out, I missed out last time because this is my um, only SM. Had my husband give me his handle this time around. Oh, this is your only social media. Oh, okay, so, oh, great. So you, we can, I can reach out to you with your husband's handle. Perfect, 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 perfect. I'm so sorry that I have to do it. I wish that I could have DM capabilities on YouTube. My husband back in the day says that they used to have um, DM uh, capabilities on YouTube. I don't know why they took that away. They're adding everything, shorts and stories. I think they're taking stories away soon though. Um, but we don't, we still can't DM. So that's why I have to go to a whole nother platform. Okay, you guys. So this is probably going to be the first time that I can actually end early because normally you end up ending late. Um, overall, this book was not one of my favorites. Um, however, I really, really, really appreciate the fact that Sylvia Plath, um, you know, she was really a pioneer in sharing, you know, what it feels like to start going, what they call, I, I'm saying madness because that's how they refer to it, crazy madness back then instead of like mental health issues or um, even like having a psychological disorder. Um, she was one of the pioneers of really describing that process firsthand. And as a woman, especially, that was not an easy feat. So I really appreciate the fact that she introduced, you know, these other books I'm talking about, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, um, you know, Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine. These books would just not even really probably be possible or as popular without books like this that led the way. Um, so I do think I prefer more contemporary versions of these stories, but, um, you know, I'm happy that we're starting off. We will be doing more novels. So if you guys have more suggestions for me, let me know. But I do know that you prefer nonfiction. And, you know, I don't mind doing nonfiction. Y'all help me so much. I read so much fiction on my own that I don't have to um, do fiction in the club. But I know some of you have been just waiting um, for a novel. And for those of you, I thank you so much for reading with us this month. Um, okay, so yeah, not a fan for me either. The emotional flat, yeah, the emotional flatness. I agree with that, um, Gerb Girl. It's definitely not my favorite type of tone, but Maggie Gyllenhaal definitely brought a lot of character um, to Esther, but she still was not a super likable or lovable character in my opinion. Okay, you guys, so remember our next book will be Hold Me Tight. Take a look at the book description. See if you're interested in reading it with us. And our next meeting will be on August, I think it was 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern. I love you guys so much. Thank you for joining.